Hi, everyone. Drew Prodi, your host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today's episode, we have Mona Sherma, celebrity nutritionist based here in Los Angeles, who's here to talk to us about her story of healing and just how, just how toxic stress can be to our overall health goals. If you are in a stressful situation in life, I think Mona's super calm voice and the way that she talks about her story is gonna be a real motivator for you to do something about that stress. It's a fantastic interview, stay tuned. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. I'm your host, Drew Proit, and each week my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and live more. This week's guest is my dear friend, Mona Sherma. Mona Sherma is a dynamic leader and entrepreneur in the health and wellness industry who works with high-profile clients around the world. As Will Smith's, yes, the Will Smith's, as Will Smith's nutritionist, she has a reoccurring role on the Facebook series, Red Table Talk, where they talk and profile about her work with Will and the entire family's healing journey. Mona has seen firsthand the healing power of food and mindfulness to heal having grown up on an ashram. Her approach is rooted in philosophy, food as medicine, movement as therapy, and mindfulness as the journey to optimize health. Mona is also the founder of Jicama, an innovative line of functional beverages and products that deliver gut health and immune-boosting benefits of the superfood Jicama. Mona, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you so much, Drew. I'm so happy to be here with you, of all people. Oh, Absolutely. I'm so thankful to our mutual friend who introduced us and reconnected us. And I feel like we've been kindred spirits in the space. And, you know, speaking of uh, Will Smith's background, any of our listeners who have seen my business partner, Dr. Mark Hyman, on Red Table Talk, working with Will Smith and the family, it was Mona. Shout out to Mona. Thank you. (laughs) Who put all that together and invited Dr. Hyman to work with the family together to help them totally transform their health. We did that in four days, didn't we? You did. You absolutely did. Uh, looking back now, I mean, that's been a few months from now. How has that experience been for you? And uh, and who's reached out to you since that time period? And how's the audience uh, taken all your content that you've put out there? And uh, yeah, I was able to, when working with Will, just say to him, you know what, since having my second child, my daughter, two years ago, I've really just been asking for ways to create more impact and to speak to more people. And it's funny, you know, talking to somebody like Will, obviously he has so many things on the go, but for a moment when I said that, he stopped everything and he looked me right in the eye and he's like, that's it right there. And I could tell that he got really excited about this in the same way that in our first conversation, when I talked about this idea of food as medicine, it was new to him and he was excited about it. And he was like, yes, that was it. But he was disconnected from this idea of food, food that, you know, it had on his body. So since the show, it's been, Incredible. I mean, you know, I was able to work with Dr. Hyman, obviously one of my greatest mentors for a very long time. And the impact, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen on your end too, has been phenomenal. The amount of people that are out there that are just living in a state of suffering, living with all of these imbalances or symptoms that they thought were normal that aren't, you know, people reaching out saying, What do you mean bloating's not normal? I don't go to the bathroom one, two, three times a week. That's not normal. So, yeah, you know, it was very overwhelming after the first episode, obviously everybody reaching out at the same time, but so rewarding and fulfilling and really just reaffirming my life's work to tell people. So I'm so honored. And yeah, since then I've been able to work with, you know, some more celebrities here in Los Angeles. I'm so blessed to live here now. And uh, it's a lot of people that are on the same mission. I think the really cool synergy that's happening between everybody is that there's a return to wanting to heal from a different means, from a different lens. So the filter is a little bit different. It's wanting to go back to self. And this idea of food as medicine, obviously, you know, it's something that's very trendy, but rightfully so. So it's an honor. Let's talk about life growing up. I read in your bio that you grew up on an ashram and our listeners heard that in the bio. Share a little bit more with us. Yeah. So life growing up was really interesting. Um, my parents are incredible. So my dad is Indian. He's from, from India. And he grew up with Ayurveda. So Ayurveda is a form of alternative medicine that is the traditional system of India that really seeks to heal the mind, the body, and the spirit using a holistic approach. 
And it uses food, it uses food as healing. It uses breathing, it uses yoga, it uses meditation. And so he always had this background of, you know, the power of food to heal. And the reason why this was so important is because my mom, who's from Denmark, different background, she has suffered from debilitating rheumatoid arthritis, an autoimmune condition for as long as I've known her, basically. So what he would do is he would take us every summer to live at an ashram. This was in Valmoran in Quebec, the Shivananda ashram. And it was there that we had to follow a very strict schedule. So if you don't know about ashram life, you follow a very you know, strict regime every day. You're up at 5.30 to meditate for half an hour. You're sitting in community for satsang. Uh, you do you know, hours of breathing, two hours of yoga. Uh, there's a lot of focus on nourishment and food that you're consuming. But the idea, I would say, is you know, it's a return to simplicity. And ultimately, having this really strict schedule causes you to really peel back the noise that's happening in your head. And I would say, you know, peeling back the layers of imbalance so that you're forced to kind of just deal with yourself and the noises and the symptoms and your feelings. So, uh, yeah, it was a really interesting upbringing, especially because, you know, I remember my dad tapping me on the shoulder at like 12 years old to meditate. And I was like, it's 530 in the morning. This isn't, it felt like torture at the time for a kid, right? But sure enough, as I went through my 20s and my own journey, and especially getting into the corporate world, that's ultimately when I went back to my roots. And, uh, you know, knowing this, the power over my roots, it really came in handy because I ended up getting pretty sick um, when I got older. So in my 20s, I fast tracked everything. My brother and my sister are 10 and 12 years older than me. And uh, I was pretty young in my profession. I worked for a handful of luxury cosmetic companies uh, doing sales and artistry training. And I would say on paper, it looked like a dream job, <laughs> but ultimately it was a corporate sales job. And, um, you know, I was able to do some pretty incredible things, but I got really sick. Uh, my digestion was terrible. I was unhappy. I was doing work that was, really was unfulfilling, but I was looking for the cool factor. I was looking for something that would really, you know, not being a doctor from an Indian family, at least I had the corporate salary. I thought I was making something for myself. Um, but I ended up eventually having a heart condition. So a heart condition called atrial tachycardia. Uh, I suffer from debilitating heart palpitations every single day that left me out of breath. Uh, and it really took kind of my life force away from me. Symptoms just getting get getting worse. Uh, I ended up having um, issues with reproduction. I was told that I was never going to be able to have children. Thankfully, now I have two kids. Uh, but really, I was just hitting a rock bottom. I knew that I needed a, a way out. And I think that it was not during my first heart surgery. <laughs> it was my second heart surgery that it was a wake-up call where I decided to, like, what is happening right now? I know an another way. I knew that another way existed for me to get off of these medications that I was on and go back to a form of healing that I had really neglected since I was a kid. Powerful. And I want to, there's, there's so many parts of your story that I want to parse out. And I want to start off with the first one before we continue forward and talk about how you turned your life around. The first one is, is that I remember you being on Red Table Talk and really providing these aha moments to Will and the family where they first, for the first time understood that not having a bowel movement, if when you don't have a bowel movement every day, that's not normal, right? Like they made that connection. This has been going on for a while, but you helped them make that connection that this isn't normal. What were some of the earliest signs of things that you saw that were normal, but looking back now were an indication of something bigger that was about to come? Such a good point because you know, the way that I describe it now is that we don't end up at disease just like that. It's the result of this idea of accumulation, which my dad always talked about growing up. So when I was in Red Table Talk, I really addressed all of these symptoms. So even for listeners, you can just go through this checklist, like how many people here suffer from bloating, from fatigue, from irritability, from anxiety, low sex drive, constipation, being indecisive, you know, all of these symptoms, we think of them as being common. I know if I were to sit with a group of women when I'm doing a, a conference, I see everyone's hand up because they all suffer from these symptoms. But what I say is just because they're common does not mean that they are normal. And over time, by ignoring this incredible, you know, system that our body has of informing us of imbalance, 
we get used to living with them, right? It's kind of like driving our car with the red engine light on. We think, oh, I'll deal with it later. Let's see how much longer I can go. And that's exactly what I was doing. I was suppressing everything. I was muscling through it. I was looking for quick fixes. I tried every diet on the world. In fact, um, when I had my first heart surgery, I don't think I was even, there's was, there was no room for me to go more hardcore. I was on a restrictive diet. I was at the gym for hours a day. I thought I was doing all of the things, but I was simply getting sicker because I wasn't addressing the root cause. And I think that this is one of the biggest wake up calls when I address this with my clients. It's like, oh my gosh, I have been living with these symptoms for a really, really long time. And to break that down even further, what do you think in your case, because everybody's story is different, what was one of those big first symptoms that you were ignoring that was at the root of what you were going through or what were those, that thing that you were like, okay, no, it can't be this. I'm going to focus more on my diet, but it actually was that. My digestion, 100% my digestion. I wasn't digesting foods properly. Uh, I suffered from lots of bloating. I noticed I would get gas from even eating really healthy food. Um, my bowel movement suffered. I went through a period where I was taking laxatives. Uh, this was a really unhealthy state, obviously prior to becoming a nutritionist, where I thought maybe this will help me lose weight during all of the indulging that I was doing, right? Working in the fashion industry, we're out eating a lot of really terrible food and drinking lots of alcohol. And so a lot of us would just take laxatives before bed thinking that would help us solve this issue. It's terrible. It's dehydrating my bowel, right? So digestion was the first thing to go. Um, and then I would say poor sleep. My sleep was second. I would wake up in night sweats. I would have nightmares. And looking back at this now, this was all the manifestation of stress, right? We know that stress shuts down our digestion, literally shuts it down. So I wasn't metabolizing my food properly. I wasn't assimilating any of the nutrients that my body needed. I wasn't eliminating toxins in my body the way that they should have been. I was doing a lot of, you know, premature uh, things to evacuate my bowel before I would even uptake a lot of those nutrients. So those were definitely the early symptoms that just kept getting worse. So let's go back to your story and take us from there. You have your second heart surgery and what happens from there? You wake up the next day, you're in recovery. Take us on that part of the journey. Yeah. So for this type of a heart surgery, uh, you don't go under, you're awake for the whole thing. You see your heart on a massive monitor, and then they go through your groin and through your neck with all of these wires. The same thing happened after my first and second heart surgery, where I woke up at the hospital the following morning and I got my heart palpitations right away. And in that moment, I just knew, okay, it didn't work. Right. I'm going to live with this label of being sick still. And what was so frustrating about that is I think the reason why I rushed into having the heart surgeries was because it was a quick solution, right? We all want the quick fix. We want the magic pill. We want the diet. And this is at the time, at a time in my life where I wasn't really willing to do the work. Um, you know, some more history with my family and how that all came to be was there was a lot of stress in our house growing up. So even with my father's awareness around mindfulness and yoga and Ayurveda and all of those things, we all describe our upbringing as walking on eggshells at home. So this stress, this feeling of anxiety was part of me probably from like early, early, early childhood, something else I got used to, to living with. And, you know, the irony with that is that I wasn't willing to do the work, right? So when I was 18 years old, my parents actually asked me for permission to get a divorce. <laughs> they thought they were doing a really great thing. Uh, they had waited till I was an adult, but in my mind, you know, what this meant was I would inev inevitably have to live with my mom and have to take care of her. I didn't know, for example, that my father was going to end up remarrying through an arranged marriage within 12 months after getting this divorce. So a very stressful time. So uh, 18, I had just fast tracked, finished high school. I had broken up with a boyfriend. I'd started at a new school. I didn't know what direction my future was going to go in. Me and my mom had moved into a smaller apartment together. So. It was a really stressful time. And, you know, not one doctor at that time asked me about my stress, about my mindset, about what was happening in my life or my world, the heartache that I was going through. 
And I don't think, you know, it would be very easy for me to say that I was going through or suffering from a broken heart, but that was definitely the manifestation of a couple of things. So digestion being off, we know that digestion and heart health are directly related. Stress and heart health are directly related, right? And um, this is definitely something that I really just ignored. So with that background, you know, at the time of my heart surgeries coming up, I really decided like, just give me something quick, something that will just make this all go away. I was sick of associating myself with a sick, as a sick person. Um, I was sick of being on beta blockers because that also meant that I was about 40, 45 pounds overweight. Um, and it was really sad when the heart surgery didn't work. But one of the moments during the surgeries, they had you know injected me with all of these things to try to induce the palpitations. And I'll never forget the doctor, the surgeon asked me, Mona, why are you crying? I've been crying probably for hours, just in there by myself. So frustrated pills, like the injections were overwhelming. And um, that was probably the moment when I realized, okay, oh my God, I'm either going to live the rest of my life like this, Mm. uh, or I'm going to have to make a drastic change. And seconds after that realization in my mind, he actually said to me, look, we found this extra electrical node. And if we burn it off, if we do the ablation, you might run the risk of wearing a pacemaker for the rest of your life. Should we go ahead and do it? As though he thought I would say yes. I was like, no, I'm not somebody who's going to live with a pacemaker for the rest of my life, right? So um, yeah, that was definitely the moment where I decided that it was time to finally do the work. And a lot of the work had to do with trauma and things that I had just repressed along with all of the the symptoms that I had experienced that I'd repressed. I had a mentor of mine who used to call those situations. And obviously, you know, two heart surgeries is one of these situations. Exactly. It's like an eviction notice. You get an eviction notice from your body and a wake up call saying that if we can't take care of things, like I'm not going to be able to stick around. And, you know, knock on wood, my hope is that the listeners who are listening haven't had that yet. And that's part of the beauty of hearing a story like yours or other individuals is that there's a message and a theme that's there, which is you don't have to wait for that eviction notice, but for the ones who have, they know how challenging it is to even find your footing from there, to find your North star and to say, what am I going to do next? So in that moment where you were able to say no, what actually gave you a sense of your own North star of what was going to come next for you? So it came in the decision, right? So I realized that what I was doing is I was adopting the behavior of a lot of the people around me, my direct community that wasn't necessarily serving this idea of a higher purpose. So in that moment, I had to make the decision to change. And I knew that it wasn't going to be easy, but obviously the why behind it was so important. And this meant me throwing in the towel. I quit my corporate job. And I decided to completely shift gears and get into the wellness industry. I went to back to the ashram that I grew up with, but this time in the Bahamas where I ended up living for two months. I became a yoga teacher there, following that really strict schedule every single day for two months, which felt like torture, but it was ultimately what allowed me to heal. From there, I became a meditation teacher, and that's what led me to deciding to become a nutritionist because, again, I was reminded living there the power of food and mindfulness. And that's exactly why, you know, I took those pillars with me and that's ultimately what is my paradigm for how I work with my clients today. So food is medicine. Ashram living means high vibe foods with no ingredient labels. Movement is therapy. Uh, Movement, obviously it's ability to circulate, but you circulate emotions too, right? I'm sure a lot of us have experienced emotional shifts when we move our body, whether it's through Uh, going for a run or on a yoga mat. And then mindfulness. Mindfulness had to be one of the pillars because ultimately it's the only thing that kept bringing me back to saying yes to me. And what I would say about describing this ashram living experience is that it's ultimately like this return to self. It's giving yourself radical permission to show yourself compassion and kindness and self-love And this is something that I hadn't done for myself. I don't even have a memory of childhood, from childhood, of when I could say that I loved myself. And with the work that I do today, when I ask the same question to my clients, the answer is pretty much the same across the board. 
there's no memory of the sense of like compassion and self-love from the distant past. It, it, they don't remember being taught how to do this. We're not taught how to love ourselves, right? And if you can imagine, what would the differences have been in my house if the languaging was a little bit different? If it was around having compassion for each other, for each other. If it was around me knowing that I could love myself, even though there was anxiety and stress that made me feel not safe, right? And so that's exactly why I think that while all of, obviously we can't just escape today and it was such a luxury for me to be able to disappear for two months and do that then, I could never do that now. I'm sure many of the listeners feel the same. But what you can do is you can take one thing from each of those three pillars and incorporate that into your life today. And when you do that, and when you give yourself permission to honor these three pillars, the your buckets, if you want to call them, all of a sudden you start gathering evidence for the compassion that you can have for yourself. You give yourself permission to all of a sudden heal and it gets you out of the cycle of negative thinking, of thoughts and anxiety that are fueling the imbalance and instead, you're slowly etching away and getting to the root cause of the imbalance to begin with. So much of giving ourselves permission, and you made this big decision to completely change your life around. You needed it. Otherwise, you may not be here today, physically living. So much of what stops us, uh, stops us from giving ourselves permission is we always have this thing that comes up, which is, what are other people going to think? And you talked about your family and your family life growing up and the stressors that were there. Obviously, I'm sure your parents were trying to do their best. How did that play into the decision to quit your job? Did you face any resistance from your family? Did people understand you? Did they not understand you? Did you have support? Did you not have support? Oh, you know, I was so blessed. I think that my family had started to see, obviously, the manifestation that me living in lack of fulfillment was having over me. And my dad ended up having a stint put into his heart. So he obviously didn't want me going down that path. My mom had quite a traumatic upbringing. She had this debilitating disease. Her entire body's deformed. She saw me going down in the same path. So I think that they had this radical of like, yes, go do it. Go do what you have to do. <laughs> and my now husband uh, was so supportive. I just took off and, and made that happen. And, um, you know, in that time, it was that judgment to your point of like self-criticism. I was always so worried about what other people thought. You know, here I was, I had fast-tracked high school, fast-tracked university, fast-tracked, got this job. I was one of the youngest in my field. I thought I got to the top of my game, but I still never felt fulfilled. It was never enough. And it's because I wasn't happy. You know, I do this exercise with my clients where I ask them to think about a time in their life where they felt happiness joy and peace. And when I started doing this exercise on, on my own to myself, I had to dig. I really had to dig back into my memory to find a memory, but it wasn't even that. It was a picture of me in a memory where it looked like I was having fun, which just goes to show I was so much more aligned with um, the idea or the symptoms or the manifestation of somebody who was sick or out of balance than somebody who was fulfilled or happy or healthy for that matter. And I think that it's one thing to look at somebody and say, oh, they look healthy, they look happy, they look like they, they have it all together. But inside there's a state of suffering. And I never gave my per myself permission to talk about it. You know, um, something that's pretty surprising about today in our society, when we ask somebody how they are, the first thing to come out of their mouth is, I'm fine, I'm okay or I'm busy, right? But fine, okay, and busy is not why we are here. They're not even emotions, right? But we fear so much this idea of bitching to the people who are asking us that we don't even want to go there. We don't want to give them the perceived idea that we might not be doing as well on the outside as we are, <laughs> as we're not on the inside. And this was me. This was my life. It was all this illusion of looking good on the outside and not honoring myself on the inside. And so I really had to go back and make that choice. And when I was at the ashram, the best analogy that I could really give this is the first two weeks felt like vacation. After that, the reality of having to be stuck there in that schedule really set in. And during meditation, you know, it got hard and uncomfortable and all of the voices, and I would even say every single negative self-talk 
right? All of those ideas, voices in my mind had really come on, but they came on, you know, with a microphone. They were so loud in my head that I would be sitting in meditation sometimes with just like tears running down my face. And this is obviously something that I needed to do. I needed to acknowledge the years of abuse that I was technically putting myself through and really needing to let that go. Um, And I wouldn't say that acknowledging it is something that enables you to let it go, but it's acknowledging it and having the mindfulness that like, oh yeah, none of that was true. Those thoughts weren't true. Those feelings weren't true. But I was telling myself that I just, I wasn't with it. I wasn't my own cheerleader ever. (laughs) And so that really just causes a state of suffering. Absolutely. Thank you for opening up and, and sharing about that. So a question I have for you is that as you become, became aware of these patterns and these stories and saw that they weren't serving you, what did you replace it with? Such a good question. Um, I replaced them with nothing. <laughs> That's powerful, you know, by the way, before you even explain, like, I just want to like acknowledge that for a second <laughs> is that that's super powerful and I could just hear it in your voice, but please, I'd love to hear more about that. Thank you. And yeah, I did that because otherwise I felt like I was going to be faking it all over again. And it's kind of, you know, the idea of, um, affirmations. I couldn't look at myself in the mirror every day and say, I'm happy. I'm joyful. I'm healthy. I'm healing. I'm vibrant. I'm energetic because you know, the, um, (laughs) the, what would feel good in that moment would just disappear and it would feel like a lie. Right. So I literally had to do nothing. And instead throughout the day, I would simply be mindful about the amount of times that I would have thoughts that wouldn't fuel health. All of our choices can either fuel health or fuel imbalance. And what I became so mindful of during that time was everything that I was doing to myself, thinking to myself, the thoughts that were literally being communicated to my body they weren't, uh, they weren't serving my higher purpose, my health or my happiness. And it was really ironic because, you know, my belief system, I knew that I was destined for success. I wouldn't have been able to go out and, you know, fast track all of these things. I wouldn't have gotten that job or anything. If I didn't believe that I was worthy of success, I was able to get things done. But my belief system was that it was going to be hard, that I was never going to be good enough that I would always be comparing comparing myself to others, that um, it just it wouldn't be enjoyable. I would always be chasing this idea of happiness. And you know, the reality for me is that it just ended up making me sick. So yeah, to answer your question, nothing, but it was just the mindfulness. And when I describe mindfulness to my clients, you know, they think about it as this point of arriving. Oh yeah, I'm mindful. I have my mindfulness practice. Mindfulness is simply the the task of being the task of awareness. Mindfulness is simply being aware. It's being aware of what you're doing to yourself that's fueling you or bringing you harm. It's being aware of the thoughts that are bringing you happiness versus sadness. It's being aware of everything that you do in your life. It could be the conversations that you're having, the food that you're consuming, the movies that you're watching, the relationships that you have really looking at all those things and asking yourself, is this fueling this higher vibration of happiness and joy and peace? Or is it fueling this idea that I'm so comfortable being with, which is anxiety, worry, tension, and fear? Mm, Powerful. I want to pivot for a second from your story because I still have more questions about it, but I want to pivot for a second to our current date and time. You know, we're recording this on Zoom and remotely. Uh, yeah. and we're in the midst of a pandemic. And I think a lot of people that are at home are navigating all sorts of different aspects when it comes to those three categories that you mentioned before, the mindfulness, the food, and the movement piece. I want to go to the mindfulness piece first. What are you noticing? Because you still are working with your clients during this time. What's the hardest thing about navigating mindfulness in the current state and times that we're in? I think that right now we're living through fear. So obviously, you know, it's a survival mechanism that kicks in. A lot of us have been riding these waves of 
anxiety because our future really is unknown. It's inevitable that no matter what, how we come out on the other end of this, all of our futures will be changed to some degree. And as a result, you know, the work with my clients, I think it's really forcing all of us to tune in. You know, if the world is being called to tune in and heal, all of this has caused us to retreat into our homes and tune in and heal and really asking us, it's required of us right now to optimize our health and our mindset so that we come out on the other end of this being prepared to take on the changes that are about to come. And while I say to people, you know, allow yourself just so much compassion to ride those waves of anxiety, let yourself off the hook for the days where you're not doing your meditation or your journaling, whatever your practices are that make you feel good. But ultimately it's, up to you and only you to decide to wake up every single morning to awaken health through mindfulness. So one of the practices that I find to be really powerful with my clients is I take them through the snapshot idea that I had mentioned. And over time, we turn the snapshot into a movie reel. So what does this mean? Most of us, when we wake up in the morning, we align with anxiety or stress. What do I have to do today? Who do I have to call? What's on my schedule? What do I have to get done? What's going on with the kids? How am I going to homeschool on top of all these responsibilities? And essentially, we start our day off in this vibration, which sticks with us throughout the entire day. So from my reference to the ashram, what if you could start your day off living in the vibration of happiness and joy, right? You have to align with this emotion first thing in the morning. So what do we do? We build your perfect snapshot. So when I asked my clients to recall a memory in their life where they really, truly felt these emotions, where they felt good, so much so that they can describe every detail. You know, maybe it was a time when you were on vacation, um, a time when you felt at peace, maybe you finished a marathon, maybe when you were a little girl and you're with your, your parents or a child. And when they can recall the details, all of a sudden, when their eyes are closed, I see the smile come upon them. Their shoulders melt away from their ears. I can see that they're changed they change their state instantly by recalling this memory. What does that mean? It means that the power of that happiness and the joy that you're feeling in that moment is being communicated to your body and you're starting your day off in that note. So can you imagine the power of doing this every single day, especially during times of uncertainty, scarcity, fear, as we're in now, right? And so many people out there, my heart goes out to you, like you're you're suffering. There's been a lot of trauma, a lot that's been taken away from you. So um, we, I think that mindfulness can be really easily thrown at, at this as this woo-woo idea. But I think now more than ever, as we look for a solution to feel better, it really has to go back to the power of our thoughts and how that's allowing us to show up every single day in every decision that we make. It could be around the food that we're eating, but also how we show up for the people who need us most in our life for still staying the path to achieve our goals and everything that we want to create because we don't want to give up, right? I think now we're calling, we're being forced to almost daydream of a future that can be more powerful than it was before. We are all pivoting, but why not pivot from a headspace that might be brand new to you in the same way that I had to do to, you know, potentially imagine a future that was very different than my reality. And I think that there is tremendous power in being able to do that and practicing that daily it doesn't have to look like, you know, a 30 minute meditation session first thing in the morning or listening to a guided meditation for an hour or practicing yoga nidra or doing an hour yoga class. Mindfulness doesn't have to be that. You need to figure out a practice for you. And it could be something as simple as the snapshot idea that's going to allow you to change your state into the version of yourself that you want to become. Mm. When you think about when I look at uh, the combination of a lot of the techniques and approaches that you bring into people, sometimes you're offering what people can add in, like things that they can add into it. And sometimes it's things that we can pull back on or maybe de-emphasize, things that we could take away. So there's adding in and then there's removing. On the topic of mindfulness, we talked about some of the things that people could add in, like the snapshot technique. Are there things that we could de-emphasize, minimize, or remove that are preventing us from being in that natural mindfulness state that our body wants to be in? Yeah, I think it's definitely going through every area of your life and asking that question, is this fueling the version of myself that I want to feel, that I want to become, or is it depleting me? And sometimes it takes some really hard choices. You know, you and I have talked about having to 
you know, shift our, our friendships or, you know, conversations that we have with people. It's being mindful about um, the things that we're doing. So to give tangible pieces of advice, I think that a lot of us rushed to the grocery store and we stocked up on a lot of this non-perishable food that's processed, right? I remember going into the grocery stores and seeing an abundance of fruit and vegetables, but the mm-hmm. chips and the pop and the soda and the candy bar were bare, right? And I get that. That was out of panic, right? That's that survival mechanism. But we also know that those are the fuel, the foods that are going to fuel anxiety imbalance and eventually dis-ease in the body. So if you have those in the house, put them into a box, put them somewhere where you can't see them. And instead, look at the foods that are going to fuel you. Other things that you're going to take out of your life are definitely the things that you are watching. Um, you know, are they are they causing you to feel anxiety? What are, what are you doing before you go to bed, right? What are you aligning with before you go to sleep when your body needs to get into this deep place of rest so that it can recover on every single level? What are you watching? What are you listening to? What are you literally absorbing, right? And this idea of absorption, whether it's through what we watch, what we listen to, or what we consume is so important. Whatever you're absorbing that isn't fueling your health, you have to remove that. I think media is also a very powerful component. I think of myself as being a pretty grounded individual. And even for me, when I tune into the wrong kind of news, or reading the wrong kind of news. And what I mean by that is that I prefer slow news, right? Things that are going to help you really contextually understand the current state of the world. A lot of the NPR podcasts are great at doing that, or the Daily by the New York Times, or long format articles that are there. Anytime I tune into the headlines or the immediate sort of breaking component, even me, I can end up getting pulled into the sense of scarcity, fear, lack, you know, that sort of component, which isn't helpful for anything really that's there. Do you have boundaries in your own life that you place with media or information during this time or just in general? Yeah, lots of boundaries actually. So, you know, it's really frustrating and sad that the media is fueling this idea of fear, right? Fear, scarcity, you name it. And this is fueling our anxiety. So for me, I, I can't turn it on. Uh, I, I want to be aware like you. I want to look at the people who are engaging in news that causes us to ask questions and to act accordingly um, from a compassionate space as opposed to a fear-based space. So I leave it to my husband, actually. So he is great at checking in once a day. If there's anything that I need to know about, he will let me know. Um <laughs> Yeah. Does that answer your question? I think yeah, that like, I really just had to defer it, defer it to somebody else to, to give it to me that way. I'm, I'm passionate about knowing what is happening in the world because obviously I want to make change. Um, I want to be supportive of people who need help 100%. But I can honestly say that the days where I've really just indulged in news and media are the days that I've also been in tears in my kitchen and just been scared and not knowing how to deal with it. And that's a reaction, right? It's a reaction that is part of our human nature, but it wasn't, it was based on, you know, I would say false evidence. Mm. I want to talk about food. We talked a little about mindfulness. There are different themes that are going right now with the coronavirus. There's uh, the COVID-15 the 15 pounds that people are putting out because they're in their home (laughs) and they're bored and they don't know what to do. So it's easier sometimes to snack or unintentionally sort of eat things and focus, especially with people stocking up on a lot of foods, especially the uh, non-perishable foods. There's the feeling of not being able to access the gym or a workout routine that people might be used to, even if that was going to a local park and walking outside, which a lot of them are shut down right now. So Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of messages from people in our community uh, through my uh, text platform where I always ask them for messages on podcasts that are coming up. What do you want me to ask Mona? What should we talk about? I'm getting a lot of messages that are some version of how do I stop judging myself around my decisions on food and how do I step into more control or lightheartedness or step back more into joy around food so that 
especially in the current times. So I'd love to just get your commentary and your thoughts for our audience. So it's interesting, this idea around with judgment. Um, I think judgment for many of us is such a learned behavior. And really what this is, is choosing the opposite of self-compassion and self-love. And it's easier to go there. I think it's often, especially right now, it's a fear-based response, right? It's, you know, having a repetitive thought every single day. We're not really able to change our state because we can't leave our houses. So when I think about this, you know, I think it, it has to come back to making a decision, so deciding how you want to feel. And, you know, I know it's an easy question. If I ask you if you want self-compassion, if you want to love yourself, if you want a body that thrives, you're going to say yes. But you have to acknowledge, you know, what are the things that could be fueling or causing imbalances and really being firm on putting those away because whatever habits you create are going to become your rituals. And we know that your rituals become your lifestyle. And so the conversation with a lot of my clients is, well, you know, what if I just wait? Can I not just stay in the state of cocooning for a little while? And, you know, the analogy is like dealing with it Monday, dealing with it January 1st, right? We don't want to get back into that pattern. Uh, and it's the same idea of really taking control of everything that you want to achieve. And it has to come back to making a decision. So making the decision for how you want to feel which means that you have to set out a plan. So does your plan involve um, going through day by day what your day can look like to optimize how you want to feel, the body that you want, the health that you want? You have to create new routines. And I highly suggest making those routines now. Um, we don't know necessarily how much longer this is going to last, but consider this. Whatever routines you set into place right now will become your habits and rituals at the other end of this, which means that they will become you. So if you still want to, or if you're now ready to get back to this idea of optimizing health and happiness, set those habits in, in place. And I think that that looks different for a lot of us. For some people, it feels more comfortable to start with a mindfulness technique. For other people, they know they just need to move their bodies every single day. Um, and there's so many resources that are out there. We have so many great you know, friends and experts who are putting live workouts on, on Instagram and on social, which we can follow and do from our own houses. When it comes to food, you know, there's no abundance of produce of all of these foods that we now have proof optimize our health and our well-being and even our mindset, right? When we think about sugar, sugar is going to fuel anxiety, you know, positive, healthy food. If I, my, I always say eat the rainbow produce that comes in all different vibrant colors loaded with fiber and phytonutrients and vitamins and minerals that optimize our immune system, but also the power of our gut health. When we know when we fuel our gut health, we fuel our mind, we take away anxiety. So focus on those three things. And I think that, you know, the way that I outline this for my clients is what are your top buckets? What are your top buckets that you would say are the most important priorities for you right now in terms of how you want to feel? So mindfulness, is it movement? Is it exercise? Is it learning? Is it dance? I think it looks different for everybody, but choose the top three buckets. It doesn't have to be this overwhelming rehaul of how you need to restart everything at home, but choose the top three things that you think would give you the most impact. There's a lot of listeners of our podcast that are parents. And there's also, uh, and out of that group, there's a lot of listeners that are moms uh, being a mom, especially with young kids can often feel already isolating because of the themes that are going on. Us not always living in a village community being different, people mm -hmm. having different, you know, just, there's so many factors that go into why it could be more isolating for mothers. And we've done many episodes about this in the past. And now we add in the level that even some of the simplest luxuries that were there for mothers, uh, especially with young kids, like going to just the park to get a little bit of a breather and meet up with a friend that was there and just chatting and doing that. Some of those have been removed inside of quarantine. W what have you been tapping into and how have you been finding community to support yourself? And do you have any recommendations for the mothers who are listening to the podcast of things that they could be doing? Yeah, we have had a couple of hard days over here. So I have a two-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son. And my five-year-old now, the school is so great. They're doing, you know, home classes for us online. 
but when we're watching him, it's just like you, we somehow, sometimes get overwhelmed with this feeling of sadness. He's not outside and running. He used to be at a school where he was outdoors every day. We can see this pent up energy within him and it just kind of breaks you down as a parent. Um, so what we realize is um, now more than ever, the quality of our mindset and how we start the day is something that they feed on, right? It's almost like you're creating this butterfly effect in your house and how you start the day. And I really believe that how you start your day is everything, especially in terms of mindset. So starting my day off uh, for me means everything. I need to take a few minutes just by myself. Uh, we've been tag teaming. So there's certain days of the week where I will have my time, for example, like right now where Craig, my husband is amazing. He'll take over and do his thing, but we're using our schedule. And and, you know, and just on a practical level, if I could jump in, yeah. does that show up as is it a day-to-day thing? Okay. So every day you guys meet in the morning and say, this is the time. Do you plan it on the weekend? How do you sync up as a couple to set aside that time for each one of you? Sundays are our day. Sundays have become our ritual day for planning everything from the food that we're going to be eating throughout the week to our schedules, to who's going to be taking over for daycare, you name it. Uh, even the lessons that my son has, we map everything out on Sunday so that it's ready to go because otherwise Mondays get way too stressful. And when you're doing it so, on Sundays, do you guys do it separate and away from the kids or your kids there too? And you're just doing your best to like navigate all that. Again, you have a two and a five-year-old, so I'm not sure if you, if they weren't with you, where else would they be? <laughs> but on a practical level, how much time does it usually take you? And are your kids usually just playing by themselves during that time? Fortunately, they are finally at an age where they can play with themselves. So uh, they're usually in the background. We'll give them an activity to do together. So we'll give them a a game to play with together, something that we know they'll both enjoy. And then we just in the same space, we'll go off and do our thing. I will say that my calendar, our calendar is our boss right now. It tells us everything. And without it, we would really feel lost or so much more anxiety throughout the week. So using our calendar has really been something that's supported us. And I would even say for a food perspective, a lot of the emails that I've been getting is like, what do I eat? I feel like I'm spending so much time in the kitchen. And so with a lot of my clients, we've been just sending out a menu. You know, here's a solution. Here's what I'm doing from Monday to Saturday. It's all mapped out. It's in my fridge. I have all the tools. I've done the food prep and it's just done. Does it take excess effort? Yeah. Is it uncomfortable? Yes. Is this what I want to be doing on a Sunday? Absolutely not but I realized the impact that it creates in my life. And this is something that I've done for a few years now in terms of just setting my week up for success. I think it's important to really set in place your list of non-negotiables, anything that's going to enable you to run your week on a more smoothly basis. You need to set that into effect and don't get me wrong. You know, we have this schedule that I'm looking at for my son for his daily routine. It took us three weeks for him to actually get into that schedule and for us to make it work. And we had to tweak it, but we finally came up with a system that actually works. So, you know, if you're trying certain things that you found haven't worked so far, keep tweaking until you develop a system that really works for your family. And this is where communication has to be everything. You know, if there's a breakdown that's happening with you and your partner, um, you need to address what that breakdown is. Ask what that person needs in order to be fulfilled. You know, with my husband, he's like, look, I just... I need an hour to do yoga, for example. I needed my 30 minutes a day to do some breathing in the morning. And so I went into the calendar. So be open with your dialogue instead of what's easy to do is just repress it all and try to muscle through the changes that we're experiencing right now. Really try to work it out, develop a system that works. Mm. Communication and planning, the solutions to all of life's areas that we want to make progress on. (laughs) <laughs> Money, health, wellness, intimacy in a relationship, connection with our family, business. It's all communication and it's all planning that's there. I think another component that comes up is that, you know, we have a whole generation of people, you know, that don't know how to cook. And by that, I mean, is that most individuals, Um, I think two years ago was the first year that restaurant spending in America specifically was higher than the total percentage of groceries. So the amount that we were spending on restaurants two years ago uh, surpassed how much we spend on groceries collectively as a society. So we know that there's more options, you know, reading out more. Mm. And today, 
I've heard this uh, statement too. You know, we're spending more time in the kitchen. We're doing like so many different dishes. Well, if I look at my mom and I look at my you know parents growing up, they would never cook for one meal. They would cook, and that would be for multiple meals. That would be there. You never sit down and cook for one meal at a time. You're cooking for multiple meals so that there's options ready. Because cooking for every single meal is just nuts and takes up all the time in the world. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. This lockdown has basically made me realize that my mother is a goddess. My mother, (laughs) my grandmother, the fact that they made this all happen. My mom, especially, she was cooking, you know, an Indian dish every single night and a Western dish every night, something that she thought that we would eat. It's like thinking, how the hell did she make that happen? Right. But uh, for me, the solution is definitely in the planning for sure. (laughs) It would be lost otherwise. Let's jump back to your story. You're in the Bahamas, you're on this retreat, in a way, recreating your past when you were at the ashram, the original retreat center, the ashram. How did you know when it was time for you to leave and continue the journey? There's a state, the same strip of beach that I've walked there. And I'd gone to this ashram, you know, throughout my corporate job during the stress as sort of like a a reset, but it wasn't ever long enough. And I was going there to, as a quick fix, right? There was one day where I was actually given my spiritual name. So you sit down with a Swami, with your other yogis, your classmates, and you're chanting the same chant. I kid you not for, I felt like two or three hours chanting and chanting and chanting. It's like, when is this going to be over? And I'll never forget, I stood up and I had to walk down this really beautiful, long pathway to try to get back to the beach where they asked us to go and sit and meditate on the power of our name and what that meant for us. And I honestly, Drew, could not even feel the ground beneath me. I felt like I was floating. And my snapshot till this day is when I eventually like made it to a certain spot on that beach that I had walked and I was sitting facing the sun and I was inhaling the power of the sun. And I felt like I was just exhaling everything that didn't serve me anymore. So inhaling energy and joy and, you know, the excited feeling that I wanted for my future and exhaling everything from the past and all the thoughts that I had that didn't serve me. Like it was just, it was done. That is my snapshot. And that was essentially, it was really my moment of like, okay, I just decided in this moment that I could actually create a future that was greater than any possibility than I could ever imagine. And the evidence for me came in that feeling because in that feeling, nothing else mattered. I wasn't thinking about the noise that happened. And the way that I describe this to my clients is we all have these, you know, invisible frequency lines, right? So if you think about a radio frequency, we can't actually see them, but think about, you know, the communication that you've had with people since you were a little kid, the events that have happened that might've been traumatic the unspoken conversations, the things that were left unsaid, the traumatic events, the things that went wrong, the things that went right. Um, You know, our parents have a really strong frequency to us. It was almost like going and turning down the dial in every single one of those situations so that all that was left was me. And so when I really say that it's this return to self, it had to take a lot of practicing for me because I dealt with so many years of not being connected to self that um, it was just too noisy. So in that moment, that was my realization. And the thing is today is that I don't think that it takes going to an ashram to have that moment. It doesn't take being given a spiritual name, but I had to be, I needed somebody to tell me that it was possible. I needed someone to tell me that this idea that I'd been living with, and ultimately it was stress, stress that was fear that I'd been living with since I was a little kid, didn't have to have such a strong hold on me. It was this false illusion. And growing up, I would even hear my father's voice, you know, talking about the power of your thoughts. My dad would always talk about this idea of accumulation. What are you accumulating? Too many thoughts, um, you know, a cluttered house, there's a cluttered mind, too many toxic foods, like they all accumulate in your body. And that's what leads to imbalance. But it's different coming from a parent, right? versus all of us wanting to go out. We're looking for the right course, the right teacher, the right diet, the right person, the right program, because we hear things differently from different people. And for me, it took hearing from the Swami that I'd known since I was a little kid to finally say it to me for me to quiet the noise and 
get back to what really mattered, which was my heart. Isn't that funny? It's beautiful. And <laughs> it's the hero's journey. <laughs> yeah. And I think a lot of people was, can, yeah. I think a lot of people can, uh, you know, relate to that. And that can be, as you mentioned, it doesn't have to be a retreat. It can be, not that anybody's traveling right now, it could be a retreat. It could be a walk. It could be a friend calling you that you knew from the past. It could be reading a book. When we are open to a sign, the universe conspires in our favor to present us with the sign. It could be a TV show you watch, a movie. It could be anything, anywhere that is that reminder for you that adds that it's not that it adds meaning, but that you create the meaning out of the situation because you're in the right place at the right time and you're open for a message that's there. It's that butterfly effect, right? It's like one decision, one decision could actually change the events of your future. If the decision is made from a sense of ease and peace, as opposed to um, anxiety or worry. And I think a lot of us make decisions based on worry. Um, you know, what if, right? Especially when it comes to diets, even if, um, if we're thinking about, you know, optimizing our future or, you know, wanting to live better when we're older, there's often an inspiration that's fear-based, right? I don't want to be sick when I'm older. I better do this so I don't get sick. And I don't want to end up with this heart issue. So it's fear-based as opposed to the idea of living in a life that brings you ease, right? When we say that digestion, in order to digest everything well in your life, this isn't just about food. It takes rest. You need to rest to be able to digest. And I think that if you approach your life from that mindset, you're actually aware of all of those synchronicities. And I actually refer to my meeting with you. You know, you and I have talked about this. It's like since that one conversation and me making another decision in another moment that was aligned with doing something that was a little bit greater, started another ripple effect of opportunities coming my way that I just all of a sudden became open to. Mm. Powerful, really powerful. And meeting you has been fantastic because, you know, I'm just so passionate about community. And I really feel that when you get the right people supporting each other, uh, which is great when it happens in a physical room, but even just by being in touch and on Zoom and text message communication, when you have the right people all lifting each other up, everybody wins. And seeing you shine and seeing you out there and working on all your fantastic projects and on TV with super famous people that I've watched my entire life, uh, it just brings, it's music to my ears and my heart to be like, wow, here's Mona lifting the vibration of the world. And it's like, every time you show something that's possible, it's like, wow, amazing. Like what else is collectively possible for all of us with the end result of helping people together? So thank you for being an example and a role model in that space. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. Thank you for inspiring all of this as well. After leaving and beginning that journey, which ultimately led to where you are today in this conversation, all the cool clients you've worked with and you're, you and your husband moving from Toronto to Los Angeles and getting set up out here. Of those three areas, of those three areas for you, the movement, the food, and the mindfulness, which one has been the one that kind of always needs a little bit more attention than the others, right? It's usually that for all of us, one or two are a lot easier, and then there's one that we have to give extra attention to. Which one do you have to give extra attention to in your own life? And how does that show up? Oh my goodness. Uh, I used to always convince myself that it was food, but it is definitely mindfulness. Mindfulness has created the most impact for me, for sure. And the reason being is this, when I think about the quality of my thoughts, I have now lived most of my life in alignment with thoughts that don't bring me health and happiness, right? So when we think about literally breaking the habit. And, and the sorry, just for, those... just for context, do you mean that you mean up until this day from your life growing up all before this period, you're talking about those thoughts? I would say up until this day, up until this day, um, the thoughts that I have, I still have to work around anxiety, the feeling of anxiety in my body or having anxious thoughts. Oh, it's my go-to. 
my subconscious perhaps wants to go there in a minute. So I'm just always mindful of the fact that those thoughts or that reality might not be true or it's an old way of being. So it's the awareness around that. So for me, mindfulness takes place first thing in the morning. Um, my rituals for my morning are everything. So the way that I, I wake up, the gratitude that I really start to feel for my body throughout the day, um, and then the mindfulness going back to a place where I can really start to align the memory of me feeling happiness and joy and make I really sit there until I feel the sensation of peace come over my body. In the days when that doesn't happen, because let's get real, I have kids that wake up at 5.30 in the morning where I have to jump off my feet and you know rush to be with them and get breakfast going and stuff like that. Um, I will always just turn into turn that into something that looks a little bit different. So that means forgiveness, right? Mindfulness practice around forgiveness that it can't always look a certain way. So for example, when my kids are in the background and I've given them some breakfast, I will go over, I'll make my coffee, I'll push the button. I will stand there with my eyes closed and I'll do this exact same practice that I will do in bed. And really, I'm going back to a moment that has given me evidence of my life of feeling good, right? And so for you or anybody listening, you know, gather evidence for the moments in your life when you actually feel really good. Keep gathering evidence for those moments so that you can recall those things to shift your state. And I think mindfulness also, like I said before, looks really different for a lot of people. Mindfulness for people can, can mean, you know, it could be sitting and journaling. It could be taking a bath. It could be having a moment with their loved one. It could be, you know, so many things. It could be, um, listening to something. So for me, it definitely takes recalling emotion to make that feel real first thing in the morning. Going back to the forgiveness piece, which I think is key because if we could always bring forgiveness in and realize truly zooming out to 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet and seeing our life from above like a drone. And if we saw our life and we could see everything, we would see we're doing the best that we can. And sure, there might be things that we want to change, but in this moment, we're doing the best that we can. So if we want to do better moving forward, the first thing we have to do is forgive the past. So how does thinking about those past moments that made you feel good, how has that turned into forgiveness? Is that just a feeling in the body that you think about that time and you sort of embody that state? Like, how does that turn into forgiveness when things don't go right and you're like, oh my gosh, my kids woke me up early. And then my husband said that he was going to help out with this, but he had to hop on a call. And, and it's just the frustration builds up. And then you feel like, okay, I haven't been able to do all the things that I wanted to do this morning. How do you turn that into a true feeling of forgiveness into your body for you personally? It definitely takes making a decision. It would be really easy for me to go back and look at my life and feel angry, feel angry at the decisions that my parents made, feel angry about the decisions that my, I made. And you know, I think for a lot of us, when we think about these moments of frustration or anger from our past, we're Maybe we should have forgiven, but we haven't yet. Notice if the charge comes up for you as though it feels like it was yesterday, right? If there's a charge that's still there, you need to ask yourself if you can forgive and move on. And I would say that this is 100% a feeling in your body. The feeling, we all know, we can all you know, relate to this stress or anger, right? They all feel a certain way in our, in our body. And we have that feeling that takes us out of alignment, and I think where the practice comes with what you're asking about is being able to stop, right? So we just called it being mindful, but stopping is, off, is also a mindfulness practice. Can you stop in that moment and ask yourself if the feelings of anger, resentment, sadness, or whatever it is from your past, if they're helping you? Or do you have the ability to recognize like, hey, that's in the past. It's actually not harming me anymore. So I, as my adult self, can make the decision from now going forward if I'm going to choose to allow it to impact me anymore. Am I going to choose to allow it to deplete me? Am I going to choose to allow it to really rob my energy, right? It's like these energy suckers, these vampire suckers from your past. And you really have to decide in that moment to, to let it go. And sometimes it's not about... Um, uh, like, you know, I think this idea of letting it go, we, we make it sound so easy. It's not letting it go. It's being awareness of whether or not there's a charge and doing the work to make sure that that charge goes away. Mm. Powerful. Uh, switching topics on a fun note, what's a go-to snack for you right now? 
what's a go-to <laughs> coronavirus snack for you right now as a nutritionist? What do you eat when you're like, you know what, I'm a little hungry. I missed lunch because I've been kind of working or I've been busy with my kids. What's kind of like your go-to snack right now? So my favorite food on the planet outside of chocolate uh, is actually crackers and hummus. And I will buy the healthiest crackers, the healthiest hummus, but I also realize that crackers are processed food that, you know, really don't do a lot for my health. So um, my go-to is actually jicama. And I'm not just saying this because I own a a business around jicama. (laughs) It's because I would say a decade ago when I became a nutritionist, jicama was actually the food, the root vegetable that I would use to swap out that food behavior for my clients. So all my clients were addicted to chips and cookies and crackers. I would say swap it out with jicama because it has a taste of sweetness to it and crisp. So jicama is actually my go-to and especially with um, thinking about my immune system, it's loaded with vitamin C. It's a prebiotic fiber. Prebiotics we know are food for your gut. So I kid you not, I have three massive jicamas in my fridge right now. (laughs) <laughs> and some people know what jicama is and some people don't just give us like a quick little background. Like what is jicama? What type of, uh, you know, vegetable is it? Where does it usually kind of come from? Like just a little background and where could you find it if you wanted to go buy some? Yeah. So jicama is uh, a root vegetable. Uh, I would say they call it a cross between a yam and, uh, I would say a sweet potato and an apple, I guess is the consistency, the texture. It's grown in South America very commonly. It's also in Asia. In Asia, they actually use jicama as a, a supplement for gut health already. So they've been onto this for, for a while. And it's spelled J-I-C-A-M-A. And what's funny now, living in LA, there's no shortage of jicama. A lot of it comes from Mexico, obviously. But when you speak to somebody of Mexican descent, they'll say, oh, my grandma used to give me jicama when I had a a bellyache or, you know, my auntie used to use jicama juice on her skin because it really helped the vibrancy of her skin. So, yeah, it's a really amazing jicama. uh, Sorry, superfood, I would say, for your gut. Uh, Prebiotic food. And it's something that you can get at most grocers, actually, these days. I know that at Ralph's and Vons and Pavilions around here, you can get it. Back home in Toronto, it was at Loblaws, one of the biggest grocers in Toronto. So it's in Canada as well. Yeah, but it's pretty available at a lot of uh, smaller markets too. So pivoting, you have a uh, your beverage company. Where did the inspiration even come from that it's like, okay, let's take this thing and let's actually make it like a drink that people can consume? So we were on our second baby moon with my daughter, India. We were in Hawaii, in Maui, eating some jicama one day. And uh, there, Craig, my husband, he's like, this tastes really good as a juice. So we came back to LA, we pulled out our juicer, we threw a lot of jicama through there and we drank a glass of jicama juice. And I was really surprised at the taste because what I thought it would taste like is, you know, potato water essentially, but there's this like (laughs) delicate sweetness to it that made it taste really good. So we instantly went online and we checked to see if anybody was doing anything around jicama juice and really because of its benefits, like, you know, it holds basically half your daily serving of vitamin C in one cup. Um, And then the amount of prebiotic fiber that you get that I've always talked about with my clients was in there. So I thought, wow, what an interesting opportunity. So we kept the conversation going. We ended up working with um, a great company called uh, Bar Lab, who are these mixologists who end up developing something for us. And they used our jicama juice in a cocktail at Coachella last year. And Mm -hmm. we were actually, so we rushed to make this happen, by the way, right? So my daughter's only two. This was two years ago. Last year, we were at Coachella. We raced to make that happen. We were the number one selling drink after water for the entire festival. Incredible. So that was great. But since then, obviously this idea of alcohol didn't necessarily align with my wellness brand. So we developed a a can with just jicama juice and sparkling water. That's a lot more refreshing and based on the power of prebiotics for gut health. I love it. Just two years later. (laughs) Fast. And, 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 (laughs) On that note, like if somebody wanted to check it out, is it available? Can people order it online? Yeah, so we're pivoting. You know, we were supposed to be at Coachella again this year. So um, literally as of this morning, we're available on Amazon, which is great. So people can go to oh, the website, awesome. which is Hickama Life, but Hickama is spelled with an X, X-I-C-A-M-A Life. And uh, there's links there. But also if you go to Amazon, you can check it out there. Amazing. Awesome. And we'll put the links in the uh, show notes as well too. So pivoting from the beverage company, Mona, tell us about some of the projects you're up to right now. Anything interesting that you're working on that you want to share with our audience that they can participate in? 
Thank you. Yeah. So I have a really great 30 day program that I just launched online. And really the foundation of this is to support this movement around no more dieting. So it's a lot of the education that I provide for my clients that's in the works. I'm trying to evolve that all the time. That's available right now. I'm also working towards creating my first book. So my book, writing that away and um, making this something that's based on my story and my pillars and essentially all of the tools that I give to my clients and recognizing that, you know, even for me as a nutritionist, I think a lot of people come to me and they expect me to talk about food, what diet you should be on, what you should be eating. And yes, that is a massive component, component. But I think that unless we address the power of your mind and the quality of your thoughts and your current state of being and your past and all of the other areas of your health, we really can't make positive changes for good to optimize your health. So uh, the book is going to be about that. (laughs) It's taking a lot of mapping out. It's easier said than done. And I guess the last thing is um, a handful of my recipes were actually just published in Jim Quick's new book called Limitless too. So there's been lots of really great things on the go. I'm so blessed for lots of opportunities that have come up. Oh, that's great. And uh, he was just on our podcast. So, you know, people can find the link to that book. We'll put in the show notes here, but also on that podcast that we did, uh, uh, did with him. It was a really good one. Uh, out of that, is there a recipe right now that you think is like perfect for like our audience and uh, that they could check out, preferably something that we could link to. Uh, that is any recipes on your website that you want to give a plug to? Yeah, so there's probably uh, two recipes that I would say. So one is a vegetarian recipe um, that I just got one of my clients, Julian Huff, on, which is kitchery. It's an Ayurvedic food that you eat a lot of when you're living on an ashram. And uh, mm-hmm. you can see that recipe. Actually, if you also go to my Instagram profile, you'll always see recipes there. Kitchery is a really great um, food to eat that's so incredibly easy to digest. It's kind of like a reset for the body is what I would say. And then, of course, we need something more fun, right? One of our favorite go-tos in this house is to make uh, taco bowls. So grain-free, gluten-free, but just using, you know, things like any ingredient that you want, actually, in the house. Throw them into a bowl. Throw in some really great taco seasoning that you love. Like, give yourself something that's that's fun. And I think the really cool thing these days is that the healthiest food that's out there for your constitution can actually be really healthy. So if you find that you have a food addiction to something like pizza or a burger or fries, whatever it is, is just find a healthier alternative. I am not one of those nutritionists that loves to spend hours in the kitchen. So um, I've really gotten by by finding the really easy, easy recipes for the things that I love. So go and take a look at those. And I would say, you know, throw a new recipe into the mix every single week. You know, a lot of us go to the same foods every single week. We make the same recipes, the same dinners, the same lunches. And if you want to optimize your health, you have to optimize the amount of food or diversify the amount of nutrients you're taking in, right? So look for one new recipe every week. That's what we do on our Sunday planning um, so that we can incorporate new skills as well because we all want uh, variety. When your family looks at all the things that you're up to today, uh, how does that feel for them and how does that feel for you? Oh, Craig, I just had this conversation. It's one of those moments, right? Like if you would ask me a year ago, even, especially 10 years ago, my gosh, if this is where I would be today, sitting with you, working with Will, Julian Huff, Bollywood stars, you know, I wouldn't think that it was real. And I think one of the moments that really made that a reality is uh, my son watched. Aladdin on television, <laughs> Aladdin with Will Smith, that version. And he said, mommy, we know that guy. You, you work with Aladdin, right? It's like, good gosh. Yes, that's it. And I would say the other moment that's kind of like surreal for me, if I were to geek out a little bit is, you know, Dr. Mark Hyman, his books have been in my house for a really long time. My mom has followed him when she was in search of a functional medicine doctor. So his books prior to me becoming a nutritionist have been sitting on my mom's shelves. So for me to be able to be on camera with him and Will Smith was an honor and a dream come true. Yeah. Makes me emotional for sure. (laughs) I think about, and I've shared this quote a couple of times on the podcast, but I think about the Joseph Campbell quote, we must be, we must give up the life that we thought we were supposed to live to live the life that we were meant to live. And 
you've done that yourself. And I think the most powerful thing in life is seeing an example, seeing an example of another human being that's done that. That was an inspiration to me when I was first starting off on my journey and feeling like, well, society wants me to take path A and I feel like I want to take a different path path B, C, D, E, whatever it might be. And I want to go to it in a different way, but I didn't have a lot of examples of people that had done that successfully um, and with integrity. And so the more examples that we hear about, the more examples we see, even if your goal isn't to move to LA and be a nutritionist, whatever your goal or vision is for your life, when you hear and see how it unfolded for somebody else, I think that gives you permission to do it for yourself too. So I hope that's a strong takeaway for our audience uh, that's here. And Mona, I want to take the moment to just acknowledge you for coming on the podcast, but also just being such a good, so being such a force for good in the world. And um, it's just been incredible to see you shine, but to do it in a way where you bring so much information, but truly never losing sight of the fact that in this space, it's very easy to go down trends or fads or other stuff or to create a system. And I always see you taking it back to your true and honest story, which is like, yes, food matters. And yes, the movement matters, but the mindfulness and the stress is such a consistent theme for me and the clients that I work with that I'm never going to let that go. Even though sometimes it doesn't feel sexy, even though it sometimes feels like we already got it, you stay true to that because it is truly the most important thing. So I want to acknowledge you for, uh, being true to yourself and your story. Thank you so much. Yeah. You know, I really do feel like this is just the beginning and uh, I think it's just the constant effort and uh, commitment to like lift this veil of expectation that we might have in front of us and really decide. And maybe it's making the decision every day. What lens are you looking to look at your life through? Is it the lens of endless possibility or is it the lens of everything is hard? For me, it was a it was a journey for sure to shift from one to the other. But there's so many incredible resources that are out there to really allow us to shift our state into this optimal way of being. And to the point of stress, you know, all of us are being called to something. There's gotta be something. There's gotta be more to it. If we are all living with this stress, and we know that stress essentially is the foundation for all of the imbalances that we have. There's got to be a better way. So honor your own constitution. Your constitution is so different than every other person on this planet. So instead of looking for the system or the diet or the thing, honor exactly what your body needs. And I promise that if you stop and just quiet the noise just a little bit, you're going to find exactly what your body and your constitution needs in order for you to thrive. Mm, powerful. Mona, thank you so much for being with us here today on the Broken Brain Podcast. Uh, you're pretty active on Instagram. If our listeners want to find you and keep in touch with you, can you just share your profile? Absolutely. Come find me. Reach out. I love hearing from everybody. Instagram is my media of choice. It's at Mona Sharma. My website's at monasharma.com. You can see me there as well, but feel free to reach out to me on Instagram. I love the connection there. Amazing. Thank you again for being here with us. Super appreciate it. Me too. Made my day. Thank you. It's an honor.